Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, please share this show with a friend. I always appreciate when you guys share it with someone who's interested in health, interested in science and coffee, any of your colleagues. It's always very, very much appreciated. Today, one of my favorite speak- people to speak to is on the line. Dr. Sanjeev Chopra is back with us. How you doing, Sanjeev? I'm doing great, Jordan. I'm on top of the world. I'm loving it, man. You're a teacher, you're a speaker, you're an author. Um, what are we talking about today? Let's let's tell people to get your book, The Big Five. How about we uh, how about we plug that book right at the top here? Five sure. best ways to increase your longevity. Is that right, Sanjeev? Yeah, that's right. Love so that book. five ways to live a longer and happier life. And you know, there are five things. There's coffee, exercise, vitamin D three, nuts, and meditation. And a good easy way to remember is as follows. On a good sunny day, go for a brisk walk to your favorite coffee shop. Mm-hmm. Now you got the exercise, you got the vitamin D from the sun, and you got your coffee. And don't, don't go nuts remembering this. <laughs> That's the fourth one. And the fifth one is before you go meditate, now you got all five. <laughs> and there's an ancient saying you should meditate once a day. And if you don't have time to do that, you should meditate twice a day. <laughs> I love that. So the first 40 pages of the book are devoted to coffee with all the research, all the findings, And now I'm going to write a book just on coffee, and I'm going to call it Coffee, the Magical Elixir. Oh, wow. And then the subtitle is going to be Facts That Will Astound and Perk You Up. I love it. (laughs) That's awesome, man. Now, you you mentioned that briefly. I'm glad you're you're going through with that, and I'm really excited to read that that book. Yeah, that subtitle was suggested by my daughter, Kanika, in New York. (laughs) I love it. And my brother Deepak will be a co-author on the book. That's so cool. I love it. That's we'll, going to be We cool. look forward to that. We look forward yeah. to that. Yeah. So, you know, I got interested in coffee. I'm a, I'm a liver specialist. I'm a hepatologist. And I'm privileged to be the editor-in-chief of something called Up to Date. It's an ele- electronic textbook mm. for the liver section, for the hepatology section. I recruited about 200 world-renowned hepatologists. Wow. And this is subscribed to by 1.2 million physicians in 195 countries. Holy cow. Yeah. All and about we, the liver. All, this is about the liver. Then there's, you know, GI. And then there's rheumatology. There's endocrinology. But a typical textbook of medicine is five or 6,000 pages long. And the day it comes out, it's a year or two outdated. Right. This one is 90,000 pages long. Whoa. And it is updated literally every single week. Wow. So we have five editors who sit in an office and four and a half out of the five days, they scan about 200 medical journals. And if they come across something new and interesting, they send it to me as the editor in chief. They send it to the section editor. They send it to the author. And then we look at it and we approve or we edit it a tad. And then it's incorporated in the next iteration. And if somebody is looking up something, they see that the new stuff is bold, italicized. They can click on the reference. They can click on the reference, and then they're connected to PubMed, and they can actually see the entire article, all the references, and so on. That's incredible. So I keep getting updated on liver disease, you know, in an effortless fashion, literally every day. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I got interested in the liver even when I was a medical student. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was really no treatment for liver disease. Oh, wow. Now we have specific treatments for very specific liver disorders. For example, hepatitis C, which we think afflicts about 110 to 200 million people in the world, we now have a cure with pills 12 weeks. And even if the person has advanced liver disease, cirrhosis, or they have co-infection with HIV, we can cure them. It's the only chronic viral infection in human beings mm. when we can use the word cure. That's insane. So we have, isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's incredible. And, and we have other treatments for other liver disorders. The most common genetic disorder known to man is hemochromatosis, in which there's extra iron absorbed from the gut. And then it gets deposited in the liver, in the brain, in the heart, and it can uh, pancreas, and it can lead to 
cirrhosis, liver cancer, diabetes. Mm. If we catch it early, before people have cirrhosis and diabetes, and we remove the extra iron, and removing the extra iron is bloodletting, phlebotomy. Jeez. So they go and donate blood once a week. Sometimes it takes 20 weeks. Sometimes it takes a year and a half wow. to get all that extra iron out. If we do that early, they have the same survival as gender match, age match controls. Wow. And then we have liver transplantation, which technically is the most demanding transplant. It's more complicated and tedious and risky to do than a heart transplant, a lung transplant, a kidney transplant, oh, wow. a heart and lung transplant combined. Wow. And we have patients with end-stage liver disease who are literally semi-comatosed or comatosed. They have 20 gallons of fluid in their abdomen, which we call ascites. They're bleeding. They get a liver transplant. And Jordan, I've had a couple of patients who a year later, two years later, have run and completed the Boston Marathon. Oh, my gosh. Okay. That's incredible. Isn't that amazing? That's astounding. So, so it turns out there are 1 billion people in the world with chronic liver disease. Often it leads to cirrhosis, liver failure, liver cancer, need for liver transplant. Not all the time, but often enough. People are dying on the liver transplant wait list because we have a shortage of donors. Oh, man. The one thing we have not been able to do is develop an artificial device that would treat that end-stage liver failure. Oh, wow. So if somebody has end-stage kidney disease, they can be on dialysis for 10 years. Right. And then they get a kidney transplant. Yep. If somebody has end-stage liver disease and they need a liver transplant, we pray that they'll get one in time. Wow. That's so Now, sad. one of the most amazing things is that you can have a live donor. So a good friend, a, a sibling, a, a child can donate the entire right lobe. The right lobe is 60% of the liver volume, and it will work in the recipient, the one who's dying of liver disease. And this person who donated the right lobe, over the next year, that liver grows. You can do CAT scans and see it grow right wow. up to the rib cage. Wow. So the ancient Greeks knew about this. So there's the story of Prometheus, right. who had stolen fire from the god Zeus, and he was incensed, so he chained him to a rock, and the vulture would come and devour his liver, but he wouldn't die because it would regenerate overnight. That's so fascinating. It's the only visceral organ, it's the only organ that can fully regenerate. Now, the only other organ that regenerates is our skin. Hmm. But if you remove half the kidney, it remains half a kidney. Wow. Yeah, it doesn't grow back. Man, that is Long, so same that is so incredible, you know. And I think yeah. that the liver doesn't get its due. I don't think we focus on the liver enough and liver health enough, you know. Everyone's talking about heart attacks or or cancer, you know, if you get sure. cancer in your liver, but but man, this yeah. liver health thing is like I feel like don't you feel that it flies under the radar when it comes to popular culture, popular health and wellness? It does. And even liver cancer Mm. is now the third leading cause of cancer mortality in the world. Wow. And in 11 countries, in, including Egypt and Mongolia, it is the number one cause of cancer mortality. Egypt and Mongolia. Interesting. Yeah. Now, in our country, with the burgeoning epidemic of obesity and diabetes, we are seeing a liver condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because under the microscope, when we do a biopsy, it looks identical to alcoholic hepatitis. But these individuals are not drinking alcohol. Uh, I, forgive me drinking, to, for, for interrupting, yeah. but isn't that kind of why we invented the, Isn't that a term we invented because usually it was only alcoholics with this condition? Yeah. I mean, every time you talk to people, lay people, and you say cirrhosis, they say, yeah, yeah, but I don't drink. Right. Or my uncle never drank. Well, he could have had hemochromatosis. He could have Wilson's, alpha-1 antitrypsin, autoimmune, BBC. Oh, or he wow. could have this condition now, which is the num dominant liver condition in our country. Up to 70 million people in our country have it. We have two-and-a-half-year-olds with fatty liver. Oh, man. 16-year-olds with significant scarring of the liver from this condition from by virtue of being significantly overweight. Mm -hmm. So we have to address this. Now, it turns out that people who drink coffee, uh, several things. Let's go through 
what are the benefits of coffee related to the liver. Oh, absolutely. Right. So the first thing is that they have lower levels of liver enzymes. So when you and I go see our primary care physician once a year, he or she will check a profile or blood test. They'll check your blood count. They'll check usually your thyroid. They'll check your electrolytes. They'll check your liver test. There are five of them. And there are two liver enzymes, ALT and ASD. And if they're elevated, it often indicates some element of liver disease. Then we need to work it up. Mm -hmm. What is it? What's the severity? Well, coffee drinkers have low levels. That's sort of intriguing, but what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Then the next study came out that people who drink coffee have less fibrosis. Fibrosis is a scarring of the liver. And if you have a ton of scarring in the liver where islands of liver cells are totally surrounded, circumscribed by connective tissue fibrosis, those that's called cirrhosis. Mm. So they have low liver enzymes, they have less fibrosis. Then a study came out that if you drink two cups of regular coffee a day, there's a 50% reduction in hospitalization and mortality from chronic liver disease. Wow. And then multiple studies came out that if you drink coffee, you have a lower risk of primary cancer of the liver. Multiple studies. Now in NASH, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the rubric is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, and under it, there's just fatty liver, and there's NASH, which is more than fatty liver. There's also hepatitis, mm. inflammation, and then 15 to 20% of those people go on to develop cirrhosis. And there's a study published in Gastroenterology, that, which is the premier journal. It's the official journal of the American Gastroenterology Association. Uh, several years ago, maybe six, seven years ago now, that people who drink coffee and have this condition, NASH, have the least amount of scarring in the liver. Mm. Mm -hmm. So coffee is truly, you know, the magical elixir, lowers the risk of diabetes, lowers the risk of six other cancers, including head and neck cancer, colon cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, endometrial cancer, skin cancer, uh, low cognitive decline, early dementia, Parkinsonism, it's absolutely astounding the benefits of uh, coffee in relationship to liver disease, but many, many other common health conditions. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the holy grail would be if coffee is so good and doing all this good and decreasing the risk of these common disorders, are we living longer if we drink coffee? Right. And now, now there are four or five studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine, Annals of Internal Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, that men and women who drink coffee have lower total and cause specific mortality. Mm. So they just live longer. Very amazing. Just you live longer. Straight up live and longer. And a dose-dependent effect. And that's and that's so, one of the things you look and f look for significantly. Let's touch on that for for a second. Dose dependent, meaning you drink a little bit of coffee, you get a little bit of benefit. You drink a moderate amount of coffee, you get a moderate benefit, and then a, a lot, you get more of a benefit. Dose dependence is one of the things you look at with your criteria for a legitimate study, right? Yeah, I think for for a legitimate study, if there's a dose dependent effect, there are mechanistic explanations. Then you say, wow, and there are multiple studies, right. all coming to the same conclusion. Then you have to say, you know what? I can't ignore this. This is unbelievable. Yes. So here's here's an amazing statistic. Alcoholic cirrhosis, which is still a very, very common condition worldwide, mm -hmm. one has to drink a pint of whiskey or a liter of wine a day for 20 to 30 years, every day, that much. Jeez. And we would be mystified how come at the end of that, a quarter century, only 20%, 25% develop cirrhosis. Right. What happened to the others? And we would speculate, we would hypothesize, oh, it has something to do with the way they metabolize alcohol. Right. Or there's an enzyme in the stomach called Genetic alcohol, marker of some kind. Yeah. Or there's some genetic benefit or they're, you know, polymorphisms or whatever. You know what the answer so is, fascinating. Jordan? fascinating. Is it coffee? Coffee. Oh, my God, yeah. of course. So if you drink that much alcohol, a pint of whiskey a day, and drink one cup of coffee a day, 20% reduction in alcoholic cirrhosis, two cups, 40%, four cups, 80%, 
I've not seen a patient with cirrhosis who drank five cups or more of regular Jeez. coffee a day. That not is, seen one patient. That is stunning, man. And I know what you don't want, Sanjeev, is for people to take this as some sort of license to pound their liver with alcohol and then wash it out with coffee. Yeah, I but mean, it's I still, all, that's very it's good. Stunning. I'm glad you brought that up because if you drink that much and you drink four or five cups of coffee, yeah, you'll protect your liver, <laughs> but you can get Korsakoff psychosis, become right. psychotic. You can still develop cardiomyopathy, alcoholic cardiomyopathy. You can develop pancreatitis. You can develop infertility. You can kill people on the road. You can right. lose your job. Your spouse leaves you. <laughs> right. You no, know? <laughs> we totally feel you. But, but what is astounding is this is like a tool in our tool belt. Maybe if we're concerned, maybe we're not drinking the pints of whiskey, but maybe we're yeah. a little bit concerned about how much wine we're drinking after dinner. And maybe, and now if we can think to ourselves, well, I can counteract, maybe counteract some of that with this yeah. uh, natural food. You get a high quality coffee. You get a nice organic coffee. You should feel good about that. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, we have so many choices for coffee, but if you have the opportunity to buy really good organic coffee, which has been tested, which has the highest amount of chlorogenic acid, which is one of the richest antioxidants. and uh, yeah, That's, that's then, what you want to go for. You, you, that's what you want to go you're for. Right, you're right. Now, is it the chlorogenic acids, Sanjeev? Like, what is it about running through this this filter of our system is coffee. I'm going to get, I'm going to get some real lay terms here, Sanjeev, prepare yourself. You're used to Harvard doctors. Now you're talking to a podcaster. (laughs) We're running this, like we're running this cleanser through the filter of our body. What, what is it? Is it the chlorogenic acids that's clearing this out? Do we know? No, there are many, many constituents. So there's one in coffee called caviol. There's another constituent called cafestol. Mm. And if I go to the lab and take a small animal and give it the most potent liver toxin and destroy its liver, I can now repeat the experiment. And before I give the liver toxin, pre-treat the animal with caviol or cafestol, and it will abrogate the liver injury. Whoa. Remarkable. That's crazy. So there's, there's remarkable? Lots, so there's many constituents, and even on their own, they have effects. Yeah. yeah. So together, and, and, they must synergize. Very likely. And decaf has the same benefits, but not as robust in all the other conditions I mentioned earlier, but doesn't seem to protect against cirrhosis of the liver. It's not the caffeine. Whoa. Now, here's here's something very interesting. If you look at the science, coffee drinkers have low levels of something called TNF-alpha. Even the term should scare us. Tumor necrosis factor. Ooh. Alpha. Then there's something called C-reactive protein. It's a marker of inflammation. And if you have high level of CRP, you're at high risk of stroke, heart attack. And the biggest blockbuster drugs are the statins, multi-billion dollar drugs. And one of the ways they work is they lower CRP. Mm. So coffee drinkers have low levels of CRP, low levels of something called tumor necrosis factor alpha, and they have high levels of another cytokine called adiponectin. And it comes from the adipocytes, the fat cells. And low, low levels of plasma adiponectin are linked with very aggressive liver disease. Mm. Coffee drinkers have high levels of plasma adiponectin. Wow. And then the other fascinating thing is the discovery and the work that Elizabeth Blackburn a brilliant Australian scientist did on telomeres and telomerase. Mm-hmm. So at the end of our chromosomes, we have these caps, and they're called telomeres. And they protect the chromosomes from fusing with each other and from fraying. It's like at the end of my shoelace, there's a piece of plastic, right? If that withers away, the shoelace gets all... Mm-hmm. That's when problems you know, start happening. It gets all frayed there. and yeah, yeah. busted up. And so shortened telomeres are linked with accelerated cellular aging. Mm. Who has shortened telomeres? Mothers of chronically severely disabled children. Mm -hmm. Caregivers of those with Alzheimer's. The worst stresses. Yeah, the stresses. Chronic, chronic, unremitting, day-by-day stress. And that's that's where all the anecdotal stuff comes from. Stress kills, stress stress makes you age twice as fast. Those are all all sayings for a reason. It's all true. It's all true. Now, who has longer telomeres? It turns out people who exercise, Mm. people who meditate, people who drink coffee. Mm -hmm. 
And the most interesting thing, this was a large study amongst U.S. nurses, and what it showed was that increased caffeine intake is linked with shortened telomeres. Oh, wow. Okay, let, let, let me repeat that. Increased caffeine intake is linked with shortened telomeres. Increased coffee, coffee intake is... is linked with longer telomeres. Okay, so clearly there's some in my mind. Not the coffee. Yeah, does this right? does not this, the caffeine? Does this point to some sort of synergy, like we said before? What else could it be? Yeah, all, who knows? The thousand constituents in coffee. Yeah, man, because you know what? And, and so, if somebody says, "Oh," and, and and the sad thing I see, two things: journalists write articles on coffee when a new study comes out, and often in the heading of the article in a good newspaper or a magazine, increased caffeine intake may have multiple benefits. Hello? It was not wow. increased caffeine. It was coffee. If you wow. go and drink Red Bull yes. on a regular basis, it's you're probably destroy. shorting your life. Yeah, 100%. I was just what oh, I was going to say. Shorten telomeres. Yeah, the, the, telomeres. The energy drinks are are really, really... Dangerous. They're super dangerous, and they're horrible for your liver. I I know someone who's going through some horrible liver issues right now because of, of their... Basically, I'm just going to say it, their addiction to monster energy drink. Yeah, but he, here's the other thing. If you go to your local pharmacy, Dwayne Reed, Walgreens, CVS, whatever the pharmacy in your town is called, and you want to buy Tylenol, 500 milligrams acetaminophen, you will get 500 milligrams acetaminophen. Mm -hmm. There is no quality control for supplements, additives, vitamins, and the active ingredient can vary between 7% and 93%. It can be contaminated with steroids. Wow. So you take this ingredient and you say, oh my God, I have so much more energy. Meanwhile, the prednisone could be thinning your bones, making your blood sugar go up, set you up for infections, give you a cataract, Jeez. delay wound healing, do all kinds of bad things. So there's no quality control. Right. Some of my patients will say, yeah, I'm taking, you know, I quiz each one of them. I grill them. What yeah. else are you taking? What else are you taking? Tell me about vitamins, herbs, minerals, laxatives, Ayurvedic products, Chinese herbs. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm taking this stuff, you know. But Dr. Chopra, it's natural. So even if it doesn't help me, it won't harm me, right? Mm -hmm. And I look at them, I smile, and I said, have you ever heard of tsunami, earthquake, lightning? <laughs> Cobra venom. <laughs> it's part of nature. It can pack a wallop. Oh, yeah, brother. Of course it can. How can you sell right. nature short and argue that it can't? Yeah. Man, you're so right. You're so right. And I think what you're talking about is even those ener energy shots. And those are even yeah. stranger. And, and you're right. You know, really interestingly enough, Sanjeev, I just I was just privy to this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, mixed martial arts. And there was a recent controversy because someone took a whole foods supplement from from whole foods, a totally natural multivitamin. And um, the the commission caught them with small, small amounts of steroids because the company yeah. that manufactured the supplements wasn't cleaning their vats well enough. Is that interesting? Yeah, it's <clears throat> nuts. I, I can't believe it's that it's, it's, it sounds like a it sounds like a fake story, but it was 100 percent true. They found out sure. that they weren't cleaning out their vats of steroids. That's so scary. Yeah, I mean that is inadvertent, but right, it's going to happen. Other but... manufacturers do it purposely. Yes, they put also stuff true. In there to put steroids to make you also feet. true, also absolutely yeah. true. But that's the kind of thing that I think that people just kind of have a misconception in their head. Yeah, like you said, like this is this is perfectly safe. It's like not necessarily. You got to really be careful, I think, and that's why if you can, you know, use natural food products like an organic coffee. That's a very, very high. I mean, we did a whole episode on what that means, and you can feel yeah. good about what you're putting in there and not have to worry so much. Yeah, great. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, this was fantastic. I feel like this is a good overview. Any final words on the liver, on liver health? What else we can do? Um, I, I think the most important thing about liver health is keep your body weight as close to ideal as possible so you don't develop this condition called non alcoholic fatty liver disease. Obesity is also linked to 20 different cancers, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, arthritis. If you have cancer and obesity, you have a worse prognosis. Mm. People with breast cancer, after 
getting the treatment for breast cancer if they exercise have a lower recurrence. Mm. So let's exercise, let's eat nuts, drink coffee, meditate, you know, be good stewards of this earth, be kind. Yeah. It's, you know, do all of that. Number two, uh, everyone with chronic liver disease should be tested for hepatitis A and B. And if they're negative, we have very effective vaccines. You don't want to get hepatitis A or B on top of your underlying liver disease. It mm. can be very serious. So that's the, the second thing. The third thing is drink coffee. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can get to two to three to four cups of good organic coffee a day, do that. The, if you go and say to your primary care uh, physician, I heard coffee is good for me and that if I drink four cups, it's better than two cups. He or she, unless they've reviewed the literature or heard a talk specifically on the benefits of coffee, will often say to the patient, you know, these studies come and go and everything in moderation is good. And that is not true. I'm sorry to say that to my <laughs> primary care colleagues, that the studies on coffee are not coming and going. They're coming and coming and coming. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and the more you drink, the better. Now, obviously, there could be a downside. The downside is it could trigger reflux, heartburn. It could trigger insomnia. There are many of us who cannot drink coffee after 4 or 5 or 6 p.m., but they've had their two or three or four cups by then. There could be a little tremor. So if you're giving a talk and you're using a laser pointer, which I prohibit my faculty from using, mm -hmm. you know, the hand could be shaking and people instead of listening are now mesmerized by the tremor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so th th there, there are minor side effects of coffee, but look at the, the upside. Yes. Seven cancers live longer, liver disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, gout, gallstones, low risk. Incredible. All in I always love telling the story of Voltaire, you know, the French philosopher who lived to 83 years when life expectancy was in the 40s. And it's not proof that he lived that long because he drank a lot of coffee. But how much coffee did he drink? <laughs> 50 to 72 cups a day. That's insane. Teddy Roosevelt also drank a lot of coffee. Jefferson drank a lot of coffee. And Teddy Roosevelt's grandson is reputed to have once said, Grandpa's coffee mug was so big, it was more akin to a bathtub. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love that saying, man. Yeah. That's incredible. Sanjeev, I feel like you're doing God's work here. You're out oh, here. You're spreading you. the word. You're... You're really enlightening a lot of people. And I think just getting them thinking and reading further is really something special. So I appreciate you using my platform to do your wonderful work. My pleasure. Okay. Jordan, one, yep. one, one, one final thing. Yes. About six, eight months ago, Coca-Cola bought a chain of coffee stores in Europe called Costa. They have seen the handwriting on the wall. These, these drinks soft drinks and diet drinks are terrible they bought it for like something like 5.2 billion dollars whoa people ask me what is the best drink in the world i say there are two there's water and there's coffee mm. if you could drink only two things just drink those if you drink fruit juices there's a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes it does not surprise you, me at all right and if you eat fruit there's a lower risk so stick with coffee and water, man. That's, that's wonderful, man. That's, ex <laughs> that's exactly what we're looking for on this show. Sanjeev, thank you for taking the time to do this. It's always such a pleasure. My pleasure. Awesome. Okay. All right. All everybody. the best. All right, Sanjeev, I'll let you go. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye. All right, everybody. There you have it. The great Sanjeev Chopra, just my favorite person to speak to. Everybody, please share the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast with a friend, a colleague, anyone who you think would enjoy it. I appreciate that so much. It's all I ask. This is Jordan River and Sanjeev Chopra from Harvard Medical signing off, saying have an extraordinary day. We'll see you next time on the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast.